How's it going? Welcome back to class. Feels like a lot longer since the last class than normal. How's the mic? Everything going all right? Is the sound volume all right, I mean? Perfect. All right. Well, welcome back to uh, Computer Science 4300. Today we're going to be looking at uh, an intro to C++. So if you are very familiar with C++, there may not be a lot of info here, but we'll be doing some a mix of lecture slides and live programming. So it should be pretty entertaining. Uh, while I'm programming, you are probably going to be getting some mechanical keyboard ASMR. 
I've done my best to do some uh, sound filtering on the mic, but it's the, the keyboard is just about as loud as my voice, so there's no, there's no real magic you can do with the audio settings to just drown out the sound of the keyboard completely. So if you don't like that, um, that's all you can do. So I'll gonna, let's see here. No real announcements or anything, so I'm just gonna jump right into the slides because I want as much time as possible to do some actual programming. Uh, I've added some commands to the chat, so you can type uh, exclamation point commands to see the commands that I have there. There's just a few right now. One of them has already been typed. It's just uh, exclamation point course, just to give a little information about what's happening. Um, it'll list the commands if you type commands. There's a couple of, uh, of little ones there. There's a timeout on it, though, so you can't just spam commands. Like um, I think it's like a few seconds uh, between the different usages of it. So let's see here. Let's get this PowerPoint going, shall we? So first, I am going to check this out. So this is the new programming in a terminal mode. So let's just see here. This all works. All right, how's that font size for everyone? Do I need to increase that or can everyone see this font size okay on the stream? This is good? All right, yeah, I think this will be good. I tested out a recording and it seems to be fine. Um, so we should be, we should be good to go with that. So let's clear that out so that this is how I'll be doing some live programming. And so let's get into some PowerPoint slides. So I'll be probably switch back and forth between the slides. Since this is a, um, where is it here? So since this is an intro to a programming language uh, sort of lecture, it's gonna be a little bit dry at first, but you know, there's always a little bit of, bit of knowledge that you need before you can really get started with something. So rather than jump right into the programming, I'm gonna uh, give a little bit of background info about C++ first. So these are some really, really great uh, references for C++. Uh, the first one is learncpp.com. It has a really great tutorial. It can take you by uh, step by step um, with learning some of the basics of C++. Just a quick um, poll here in the chat. Oh, can I do a poll? I think I used to be able to do a poll. I forget how though. So if you've done C++ before, type a one. If you've never written C++ before, type a two, and we'll take like an informal poll there. So this uh, learncpp.com, really great tutorial. I recommend anyone who hasn't done any C++ before, go check that out. It's not absolutely necessary, but it'll probably help you out. Uh, cppreference.com is absolutely incredible. I am on this website at least twice a day. Um, between cppreference.com and c++.com, if you Google something like how to read from a file in C++ or a C++ vector add or something like that, usually that's the website that it's gonna take you to. So those are really great references um, for C++ and I either highly recommend checking them out on your own or between that and Stack Overflow, that, that's, that's how you're gonna end up doing this course, right? All right. So what is C++? It's a programming language that, now this is all my opinion. I'm not the person who created C++. If you ask a bunch of different people um, like what C++ is, they'll probably give you different answers. I have around 20 years of experience with C++, but I am by no means a guru at C++, okay? It is a language that you will find very quickly. The more you learn, the more you learn that you don't know. Um, there is nobody that knows all of C++. It's very, very difficult, at least, to learn all of C++. And there's no practical reason to learn all of C++ either. We are going to get by in this course with a very, very, very small subset of C++. So don't worry if you've heard that it's really, really hard to learn. We're not going to be learning the parts that are very hard to learn. So it focuses on two main things, functionality and runtime speed, okay? So if you need to write a program that is very, very performant, I would suggest C++ for that. Uh, people, you know, oftentimes they get into these sort of religious debates about what the best programming language is. And 
having a debate about what the best programming language is just shows inexperience with what programming languages are actually used for, right? Because a programming language is just a tool. So imagine if you went to a carpenter or someone on a building site and asked them what the best tool was, right? It's, it's just a stupid question because is a hammer the best tool? Or is a saw the best tool? Or is a drill the best tool? You know, you, you have different programming languages that are tools that you use in different situations. And so C++ is a tool that you would use if you want to write a lot of the memory management yourself, if you want to write um, a lot of code yourself, if you want to uh, have the most performance possible out of a program. Um, so C++ is a compiled language. So um, I would say, uh, some people would say that it's a low level language, but I, I would consider a low level language to be something like assembly. C++ is a mid-level language, so you can specify pretty much as much as you want um, in terms of like how much you're interacting with the bare metal in C++, right? To the point where you could actually write assembly in a C++ program and have it, have it be run for you. I would consider Python to be like a high-level language. Um, Java, not necessarily a high-level language, but definitely higher level than C++. So, um, some of the advantages of using C++, it's very widely supported and widely used. Um, so there are many, many libraries available for C++. In this course, we'll be using one library. Uh, it's called SFML. It's the Simple and Fast Multimedia Library. And we'll be using that just for things like drawing textures to the screen and handling some input events. So if we were to sit here and write our own cross-platform graphics library, that would be the entire course. Actually, that would probably be a PhD thesis, right? So we're just using that for convenience to be able to draw things to the screen. But everything else from the course will be written from scratch in C++. Um, if you write C++ in the correct way, the resulting code is very fast. But if you write it in an incorrect way, um, the same code written in C++ could actually be slower than in a programming language like Java. And so we're going to see why that is, things like passing by value versus reference and how you allocate things and using the heap versus the stack. If you write it correctly, it will be very fast. The syntax is very similar to Java um, in comparison to some other languages. So you should be, even if you've never looked at C++, if you have seen Java, and according to my survey that I sent out, every single person in this course um, has seen a little bit of Java at the very least. And so the syntax of things like declaring classes and, and um, things like that is quite similar. It's not exactly the same, but we'll go over some examples of that today. Uh, C++ programmers get hired, right? Um, so there are many jobs available in C++, and not only that, but if you can write C++, then everything else is almost like cheating. After I go back from C++ to writing in Java or writing in Python, it's, it's, it's so much easier. Um, it, it's like cheating. So uh, the code is also very, very highly customizable. And as we get into the course, we see how that's also a disadvantage of C++. So you can overwrite every single operator in the language. You can do things, you can do things in C++ that you can't do in any other language. Let's just put it that way. Some disadvantages is that it is much easier to write unsafe code in C++ than it is in a language like Python or Java. Um, and those unsafe, that unsafe code will just crash and give you very little to no explanation of why it did. Uh, you must manage your own memory. So we will see how we can write code in which we don't have to manage our own memory. But in general, C++ is not a garbage collected language like something like um, Java is. And so we do have to manage our own memory. However, we will show in this course using our AII why that won't be a big issue for us. Compiler errors can be hard to interpret. This is more true of C++ than any other language I know, especially when you get into things like templates. Um, so you might have, like for example, one little typo in a bracket or a semicolon and you get 20 pages of error messages. So my uh, advice to you is whenever you get an error message that's really long, go all the way up to the top and fix the first error. And if you fix the first error, you may fix all the errors. But this is getting a little better. Um, for example, Clang has really, really nice um, error handling or error messages when you go to compile. 
The syntax of C++ can be a little bit confusing, but we'll get around that. Once we beat you over the head with enough C++, it'll be fine. Um, and I think the biggest disadvantage of C++ is because it is so customizable, it's very difficult, it can be very difficult to read other people's code due to the custom definitions, operator overloading, being able to like hashtag define and all kinds of stuff like this. Um, so we're going to keep our code very simple so that sort of like what you see is what you get, right? We're not doing anything hidden behind the scenes. Um, so just keep in mind that if you do read someone else's C++ code, it can be difficult to interpret. And that's one of the main, um, the main uh, disadvantages of C++. And of course, you can't talk about C++ without talking about C a little bit first. The C was created by Dennis Ritchie in Bell Labs in the 1970s. It is available on everything. So if you have a toaster, it can probably run C. Um, it's procedural, low to mid-level language. It has no object-oriented programming in the traditional sense of having like classes and inheritance. Um, it's very popular for system software, drivers, uh, embedded design, operating systems. So for example, Linux is written in C and it greatly influenced the development of C++. So if you know C, but you don't know C++, you've got a little bit of a head start. C++ was created by Bjorn Strustrup at Bell Labs. Um, originally called like C with classes, very, very early on. Um, it was developed in 1983. It is a procedural superset of C. Now there are lots of C++ purists who will hate me for saying that. There are exceptions to this, but for the vast majority, the entirety of C is contained within C++, okay? So most, and I mean 99% of C programs will compile in a C++ compiler, okay? So if you hear people say that C++ is a superset of C, it's technically not correct, but for most practical purposes, it's correct, all right? So that's, that's my attempt to appease everybody, is that for the most part, the syntax of C is contained within C++. Uh, it, it supports object-oriented programming, so inheritance, and it supports generics in the form of templates. Um, it maintains the efficiency of C, or most of it, so it's very, very fast. Um, and it's very, very popular in video game development, especially. And it heavily uh, influenced the development of both C Sharp and Java. So I like to give some upfront quotations about C++ that I've seen around the internet from, uh, from various people. And so one of them is, writing in C or C++ is like running a chainsaw with all the safety guards removed, right? So this is kind of gets at, and these are all fun, right? The, the thing is, these quotations were all written referencing old versions of C++. Since C++11, it's actually very easy to write safe code in C++. But I like, it's just for humor to, to include these quotations as well. In C++, it's harder to shoot yourself in the foot, but when you do, you blow your whole leg off. Actually, I made up the term object-oriented, and I can tell you I did not have C++ in mind. C++ is an abomination. Everything is wrong with it in every way, so I really tried to avoid using that as much as I could and do everything in C at Netscape, right? So you can tell how old these, these quotations are from the slides. And here's the, uh, uh, the man himself, Linus Torvalds, talking about C++. So this was a post in 2007, by someone on one of the Linux uh, groups. And I said, when I first looked at Git source code, two things struck me as odd. Pure C as opposed to C++. No idea why. Don't talk about portability, it's BS. And then Linus comes back with, you are full of bullshit. C++ is a horrible language. It's made more horrible by the fact that a lot of substandard programmers use it to the point where it's much, much easier to generate total and other crap with it. Quite frankly, even if the choice of C were to do nothing but keep the C++ programmers out, then in itself would be a huge reason to learn C. Now, Linus is one of the most outspoken people um, when it comes to C++, but I don't think he truly believes that the language is terrible. It's just that it's bad for things like Linux development, okay? Where you would prefer to use a language in which 
many, many people can work together with the same project and you know exactly what the code that you look at is doing, okay? So I agree that you wouldn't want to write like Linux in C++, but these are just some funny quotes about C++. All right, so C++ versions, you're going to hear a lot about different versions when you look online. First appeared in 85, C++ 98 was the first standard version. And so if you go, for example, if you SSH in one of the machines um, at the university or most machines that have GCC installed and you type G++ to compile a program, it will by default usually use C++ 98. C++ 11 um, was where I started to really, really heavily get into C++. Many, many new features, a bunch of quality of life improvements. This is where, in my opinion, C++ became a language that I wanted to use rather than the language that I was forced to use. C++ 14, 17, and 20. In this course, we will be using C++ 17, okay? So um, if you want to use C++ 17, there is much nice new functionality over C++ 98 and some more over C++ 11 that we will be using. But the stuff that is new in C++ 17 that isn't in C++ 11, we will only be using like half of a percent of that new stuff. In fact, I think there's only two or three things that we're gonna be using that are in C++ 17 rather than C++ 11. But we will be using many, many, many features of C++ 11 that are not in C++ 98. So when you go to compile your code in this course, you have to make sure that you have dash standard equals C++ 11. Or if you're using Visual Studio, then you want to make sure that um, C++ 17 is the selected programming language. All right, so first, before I go into this, I got a few questions. So Samanto said, would it be okay if we used VS Code? So if you are using Windows, it's unfortunate that VS Code is named Visual Studio Code because Visual Studio is a full-fledged IDE with a C++ compiler built in, okay? It's not just a text editor. Visual Studio Code is essentially a glorified text editor that allows integration of other things. So yes, it is an IDE, but Visual Studio Code does not use, um, does not have a built-in compiler. So if you are using Windows, do not use Visual Studio Code. Use Visual Studio 2019, as I have said in the instructions for this course. So if you haven't set things up yet, I recommend going to the course website on the course website, under assignments, there are, um, there's a setup uh, text file. Read that and, and set it up that way. Because with every assignment, I am literally giving you a Visual Studio project file, okay? It is by far the easiest way to do this course. It's just by double clicking the Visual Studio project file and you start editing and then you hit run. It's, in my opinion, Visual Studio is is the reason I still use Windows. It's an excellent, excellent IDE. Uh, someone else says, if we don't want stop the world GC, don't we need to do manual memory management? Yes, so C++ has mem manual me memory management, but we will get into how that is not going to be an issue for us. Is there a specific version you want us to use? Yes, C++ 17. Um, I recommend not using MinGW for this course. I recommend if you are on Windows, use the Visual Studio project that I give you. You don't have to, but it will be far easier for you if you do. Trust me. Please trust me when I, when I say that. The visual debugging in Visual Studio is the best debugger that I've ever seen. But if you are using Linux or Mac and you want to use... Um, Visual Studio Code as the text editor in which you integrate either Clang or GCC, then you can totally do that, okay? I just do not recommend it for Windows. Okay, some more properties of C++. C++ is statically typed. That means that the variable type is defined before use. So for example, um, int year equals 2018, okay? Java and C are already statically typed. Um, variable types are defined at compile time. So when you save your file, 
um, and you compile it, that's when the types are defined. Python and JavaScript, for example, are dynamically typed. That means you do not, excuse me, you do not have to define the type. All right. So variable types are defined at runtime in Python and in JavaScript. So let's look at our first C++ program and we'll go through this, okay? So this is the standard hello world and here is the entire program, okay? One, two, three, four, five, six lines of code. And I will go through each line of the code now. And then later on, we're gonna type this up and we're gonna run it and we're gonna introduce some errors and we're gonna see what those errors are and how we can fix them, etc. So the first line, the first line is what's called a preprocessor directive, okay? We'll talk more about the preprocessor later, but essentially when you compile something in C++, there's two steps. First is called the preprocessor, and second is the actual compiler. And I'll show that whole pipeline later. So this um, hashtag include IO stream, okay? That will include a library for us. So this is how we include libraries. So in Python, we would say import, I believe. In Java, it's something else. Um, so this is used to include a library in C++. This particular library called IO stream or input output stream is used for input output streams. So if we want to output to the console in C++, we will use IO stream. So it will let us use standard C out, this syntax, in order to print things and those things will come out in the console. Okay, so here's the next line. So this is int main. So this is a function declaration with some arguments to that function, okay? The function is called main. It returns an int and here are the arguments. So every C++ program must have a main function de defined, okay? If you're going to talk about like creating dynamically linked libraries or shared objects and stuff, that can be a little bit different, yes. But for the most part, your standard console application has to have a main function defined. So this is the function that will run when the program starts. The contents of the function are enclosed in curly brackets, just like they are in Java. And the main function has an int return type, okay? So the int return type, whatever you return from main is actually the type that gets returned to the console um, for the purposes of saying whether or not your program terminated successfully. So if you return a zero from main, it means, hey, everything went fine. If you return anything but a zero, then your console interprets as that as an error code, right? So you can return negative one, and then whatever called your program can interpret that negative one however you want. All right argc, so there's an int argc. This argument is the number of program arguments that you, you pass in when you call the function, okay? And I'll show, I'll show an example of that later. And argv is a string of character, sorry, it's an array of character arrays, which is an essentially an array of strings, okay? So this is exactly the same functionality as Java's string args, right? So public static void main string args in Java, that is exactly this, except that, well, these are C style string arrays. These do not have a built-in length. So you have to pass in both a length and this. But when your program gets run, these, these arguments are passed in by the console. We never have to worry about these arguments. All right, the next line of the program, standard C out, hello world, okay? So this line prints the string, hello world, exclamation point, and then a new line to the console. Standard is a namespace. So this is where the differences with Java start to come in, okay? So you know in Java you said, what is it? Um, System.out.println. Like, so the system um, library has an out object that you print line on, okay? So just like there are libraries built into Java, Standard is a namespace. So that's the namespace, and we'll talk about that a bit later. And instead of calling like system.out, this is standard colon colon c out. Okay, so this is like the dot in Java. So standard is a namespace um, that contains the c out output stream. This right here, if you've never used C, you've never seen this before. That's the double left angle operator. I call it the pipe operator, and it pipes 
inwards, okay? So if you look at the direction that these arrows are facing, you're essentially sending this string this way into the C out stream, okay? Anything that gets sent into C out gets printed to the screen. And that's how I sort of visually intuit this operator. It can be used to print any base C++ type, and each C++ statement must end in a semicolon. All right, C++ is case sensitive, so you have to be careful about case sensitivity. The only case where C++ is not case sensitive, it is case sensitive as a language. However, if you include a file in Windows, the Windows file manager is not case sensitive, okay? So if I say include myclass.h in C++, the myclass.h, that's not case sensitive when the Windows compiler goes to run it, but it would be in Linux. So that's the only case, and it's just because Windows is stupid with that. I really wish Windows was case sensitive. All right. So the last part is return zero. Main has a return type of int. If you return zero if a program ran to a normal end. You return something else if there's an error. And that's used by other programs, like for example, the console that runs the program to detect errors. Your program may compile and run without this, but it's highly recommended to use it, okay? So yes, you can compile or run a C++ program without return zero, but just get into the habit of putting return zero there. Now, White space in C++. If all you've ever done is Python, hopefully you haven't, um, white space matters very, very much in Python. But for the most part in C++, white space does not matter, okay? So all of these will produce equivalent results in C++. All of these are fine as well in C++, so this is identical. So for example, we can put the whole function on the same line. We can put uh, the curly brace on the same line and then end it on the next line. Uh, we can put them both on the next line here, or we can use um, curly braces on the, on the one line. So white space only matters in a couple of exceptions, all right? So for example here, you cannot break up a string literal with a new line, okay? That is something you cannot do. Um, you cannot break up a comment by white space like this, okay? So if your comment spans two lines, this is no longer part of the comment, all right? So that is when white space matters, but just write, you know, we'll have some standards that we implement um, in this course, so just use those standards. Now, here's where the debates happen, but you know, just like any job that you would go to, they would have standards that, that um, you would adhere to there. We are going to have standards in this course that you adhere to here. So um, we, so in Java, in JavaScript, um, you would probably implement your braces like this, okay? This is the, the K and R style and all of its variants where you have uh, a conditional sta statement where you have your opening bracket on the same line and then later on you close it out. This has efficient white space usage, so you use fewer lines like this. I prefer for C and C++ to use the almond style braces. And the reason for this is that, now, it, is that because to me, matching up opening and closing brackets gets very, very convenient in a lot of cases. Now, I know that some of you don't like it. Um, I used to hate it, okay? So before 2012, I couldn't stand this at all. I used to say that people who used almond style were ridiculous. Why are you wasting that extra line? And then I was forced to program in almond style when I was working on a group project. And about two months later, I found it way better. And it, it, to me, it makes things um, more clear when programming. And we will be doing this in this course and there will be one or two percent every assignment to adhere to style, okay? So we actually read the code in this course, and there will be, you know, did you adhere to the style of the programming? And the reason for that is, when you go out to a job 
and you actually start writing and editing code that other people have written, you have to adhere to the same style. No matter which style of these two you prefer, the only wrong answer is to mix them. Okay, mixing the styles is the worst possible case. So just don't do that. And in this course, all the skeleton code that you'll be given will be given like this. So we're gonna to adhere to that for this particular course. In my course where I use JavaScript, we use this, okay? So it's not necessarily correct or incorrect to use either. It's just that in this course, we're going to be using Almond style. Okie dokie. So, C++ standard library, or the STL. This is a collection of classes and functions available within the C++ language. Some example functionality that you get from the STL, you get strings, you get input output, streams, files, generic containers, so things like vectors, sets, and maps, they all work the same that they do in Java in terms of how you would use them. Um, container functionality, so you can fill containers, copy them, erase them. You also get all sorts of algorithms, um, and, and as you go into C++ 11, 17, 20, you get more and more algorithms. So you can sort your collections, you can do max and min and all sorts of cool stuff. So when you want to use the C++ library, you have to include whichever library it is you want to use in your program. So as you saw before, we included IO stream. Um, you would have to use include vector or include map or something like that if you want to use them. They are referenced in your code via the standard namespace. Some people call this std or std. I just call it standard. Namespaces encapsulate code, okay? I'll give an example of this when I do some live coding a little bit later. So I can define a namespace like this. So I can say namespace Dave, and then within the brackets goes everything in the namespace. Then I could say int ivar equals 10. And then if I want to refer to this variable somewhere, I can say Dave colon colon ivar, right? So this is actually very, very useful. It helps us, um, it helps us organize our code. So for example, in this course, we're going to have a physics library of functions. So we're gonna have some physics functions and we'll put that into a physics namespace, right? So we can say physics, is there a collision? Physics, get the distance, etc. cetera. Um, so some examples of, of this from the standard library, we have standard string, we have standard vector, we have standard map, okay? So those are just some examples and I'll get into those in a bit. Um, now, when it comes to the source code, uh, the program code is going to be written in CPP files, all right? So for example, we will have main.cpp. It doesn't need to be called main.cpp. There's a big difference between uh, Java and C++ is that in C++, the name of the file essentially means nothing, okay? You could have a file that was called vector.cpp and inside that file, uh, there was a student class, okay? The naming of the file is only there for your bookkeeping purposes. You may see in other projects, uh, C++ uh, ha have the extension capital C or capital CPP. In this course, we will be using .cpp, okay? And this is used for the function and class definitions. Also in C++, you will see header files. So header files are a big change for anyone who hasn't done C or C++ before. So in Java or in Python, you do not have header files. So header files typically are written in .h files. So you might see something like math.h or myclass.h, and this is used for function and class declarations. And I'll get into all of that probably a little bit more in the next class, but in the first two classes, we'll cover all of this stuff. So, before we get into actually writing it, the last thing we need to know is how you actually compile the C++ program. The C++ programs are compiled into binary executable files that are run directly by the CPU, okay? So this is different from Java. In Java, you have a virtual machine, so the Java virtual machine, or JVM. You have a .java file. And when you type Java C to compile your Java file, it gets compiled into a .class file. 
So that doc class file is not run directly by the operating system. It is run by the Java virtual machine. Okay, so there's, there's one step in between your program that's compiled in Java and the actual hardware. And there's a little bit of speed loss there. Okay, I think it's on average between like five and 10% for, for most types of programs. Um, so there's no virtual machine in C++ like Java. If you take a program that was compiled on one operating system or one particular processor, it may not work on another operating system or processor, okay? Because it's the actual code that that machine runs. There's no interpreter like in Python. So in Python, you don't have to actually compile your code. In JavaScript, you don't have to compile your code. It's interpreted, okay? So this results in usually faster execution, but at the price of lower level programming. So we will do a bit lower level programming, but the code that uh, runs will be faster. Um, there are many, many different C++ compilers for different operating systems. So I just got a question here that's really relevant. Doesn't C++ have a runtime though? So yes, you may have seen things like um, the Visual Studio runtime. And what that is, it's, for example, a collection of dynamically linked libraries that your program can call. So for example, if you used uh, Visual Studio 2019 to compile your program, then Visual Studio 2019's libraries have to be installed on a machine for it to be able to run. So for example, the STL will be contained in there, right? So if you use things like standard string, all of those libraries aren't compiled statically within your program. Right? They all live in the runtime libraries that are on your system. And so, but it's not a it's not a virtual machine like Java. It's just a collection of libraries that are external to your program that your code can use. Okie dokie. So the C compilation process in theory is complicated, but in practice is simple. Okay? So step one. Your source and header files are run through the preprocessor. Actually, you know what? Before I do this, let's... Uh... Oh no, I, I do want to go through this first. Okay, so step one, the source and header files are run through the preprocessor. So here you have some header files, you have some source files, and you run them through the preprocessor. The preprocessor... Oh. And what happens is if there are any syntax errors or errors for the preprocessor side of things, like for example, if you said, hey, go include this file, but the file doesn't exist, that will create an error at the time of the preprocessor, okay? Next, the preprocessor outputs an expanded source file. So the preprocessor essentially takes all of your files um, that are code and combines them into an expanded source file. That output is then run through the compiler, the actual C++ compiler. If the compiler has any errors, for example, if you missed a semicolon or if you tried to call a function that doesn't exist, then the compiler will throw an error at that stage, okay? Then, depending on your, the options that you passed in, you have object files, okay, that are created. So object files are in a very hand wavy, but not really way like the class files of a Java program, okay? These are compiled um, files. And what happens is every CPP file you have will create its own object file, if you've told it to do that. There's some hand waving going around here. Um, then the linker is run and the linker combines your object files with the library of object files that are on your system if there, are any there, if there are any errors there, then the linker will throw an error, okay? So for example, if you've called a function that is supposed to be on your system but isn't there, then the linker will say, hey, this function doesn't exist on the system. And then that will produce an executable file and that executable file will be able to run, okay? All that stuff happens. You can do all of that in one command if you want. And in this course, we'll be waving our hands a bunch and it'll be magic and we'll just be using the one command to compile everything. Because this is not a C++ course, I don't want to have to get into creating make files and stuff with you, but you can feel free to create your own make files if you want. So there are several C++ compilers. Um, so for example, if you're on Linux or a Mac, there's a GNU C compiler or GCC. 
the command that you would run to compile C++ is G++. There's also Clang, okay? So those are the two that I'm familiar with. In Windows, there's Visual Studio and there's MinGW. Again, for this course, please just use Visual Studio. I will not be offering any support whatsoever if you are using MinGW. Officially, the course will be using, um, if you're in Windows, it's the Visual Studio compiler. If you're on Linux or Mac, it will be the GNU C++ compiler. I say on lab machines here, but we're obviously not running in the lab this year, so that's okay. Visual Studio, when you hit compile in Visual Studio, all of this happens behind the scenes. It's just completely hidden from you. But knowing this process is really important because if you encounter um, specific errors at specific times, then you want to know like what that process is so you can try and debug something. Like for example, you really want to know the difference between a linker error and a compiler error because how you fix those two errors are completely different. Um, and that's what I just said. All right, so we have some program written in myprogram.c. I don't, why did I say C? I'm gonna fix this to be .cpp. Just give me a second. Okie doke. So if we've written a program, what the hell, I just saved this. Live, live editing. All right, so we've written a program in something called myprogram.cpp. If I want to compile and run that, I can type g++ myprogram.cpp. By default, the output of the g++ command goes into a file called a.out, okay? It's an old naming scheme, I'm not sure, but um, now, to, if you want to specify the name of the executable, you can very easily do that um, just by typing dash O and then the name of the executable, right? And then you can run it with my program. Very, very easy. All right, so let's get into an example of this now. So I'll close that down. And I want to start showing some examples of some C++. So uh, I got a question here. Where can I watch lecture one? So for students, uh, you know where to watch lecture one. For non-students, you can go to the videos part of my Twitch channel and you can watch the previous lectures there. So here we go. Let's do some console programming. All right. So. I'm going to be using uh, Vim for this. Uh, type Vim in the chat if you've ever used Vim before. So Vim is a console um, IDE slash text editor, and it is very, very powerful, but the learning curve for Vim is a little bit difficult. One of my favorite jokes of all time is that I've been using Vim for 20 years, but it's only because I don't know how to exit, right? So that's what we'll be doing. So here I have just SSH'd into the uh, Garfield, which is one of the machines at the university, which you can SSH into. Um, I've got some files here, so it's great. Bunch of people have, have used Vim. Um, so I'm gonna create uh, a program here. Let's call it program, or let's call it uh, 40 uh, program.cpp. All right, so I've got a blank file here. We're gonna be doing some live programming. And uh, some people can use Nano, you can use Pico, there's Edit, there's all sorts of things. I'm gonna be using, um, I'm gonna be using Vim for this. So let's create that program that we looked at uh, earlier in the notes, right? So we've got include IO stream. So this allows us to use uh, standard, C, standard C out. Now we've got main, that's our int main, int argc, char star argv. Now I can say standard C out hello world and then return zero. Okay, now I'm going to WQ. So in Vim, you type WQ to write and then quit. Okay, so if I look here, now I've got my program, uh, program.cpp. I'm going to remove test.cpp and remove a.out. Okay, so I've got program.cpp. Now, if I want to compile that, I can type g++ 
program.cpp. There's no errors. If I type ls, now I've got a.out. If I type dot slash a.out, then hit enter, hello world, right? Okay. Let's go back into, um, and welcome to the ASMR of my keyboard. I apologize that it's so loud, but you know, mechanical keyboard for life. So here, let's do something where I introduce an error. Okay, so I'll just put like some characters in here and then I'll save that and I'll go back and I'll try and compile that again. And here it says, uh, error, see this, the typo that I made is not a member of standard. So what that means is standard colon colon, it expects this thing to live in the standard namespace, right? And it's not there. So this compiler happens to give me some actual useful feedback, which is, um, hey, maybe we suggest using C out instead of this, right? Okay, so I have written into my vimrc file some hotkeys that allow me to do that from within vim. So I'm no longer going to be going back to type those things. So if I hit like control B, it will just do this. So I have it set up and I can, I'll share this with the class if you wanna practice some C++ in vim. It's a little annoying to go back and forth between vim and the, and the console, etc. So what this will do is when I hit control B, it will save the file, run the compiler. If there are errors, it will stop and show me the errors. If there are no errors, it will run the program. So here in this case, I'll just show you again. I just hit the hotkey, it saves it, compiles it, and shows me the error. If I go fix the error, and then I hit the button, it saves it, compiles it, and runs it. Okay, so this is really good for teaching. Um, I can show you this later, how I set that up. It's, it's really nice for just very quickly being able to, to run some C++. All right, so for example, if up here, if I comment out include IO stream, then I'm no longer including the library that lets me use standard C out. So when I go to compile, it says, um, it gives me some very useful information actually. And it says, hey, standard C out is defined in here. Did you forget to include IO stream? Like this is infinitely better than the compiler messages that, that there used to be, right? So this is some things that, so it's not as bad as it used to be, but some of the error messages can still be kind of bad. All right, uh, now uh, one thing I would suggest is, so slash n of course is the new line character. So by default, standard C out will just keep printing to the same line. That's why I printed a new line. You can also use this. It's, it's something in the standard called ENDL or end of line, all right? And what this does is the end line character or the new line character in Windows is actually different than it is in Linux. Really annoying. In Windows, it's actually slash R slash N and in Linux, it's just slash N. Just don't ask me why. But what this will do is it makes sure that whatever operating system the compiler was written for, it will use the proper end line character. So if you see me write this, it's essentially the same as slash N. Okay. Something else you can do that a lot of people will tell you to do is the following. So you can type using namespace standard. And what this does is that I no longer in this file have to type standard anymore. If I do, it's okay. But essentially what it will do is when the compiler goes through, if it doesn't recognize a command, it will look it up in standard because I've said, hey, I'm using standard. Now let me compile this again and it worked just fine. However, I am not a fan of this. I am, I am a fan of never using that because I want to know all the time which namespace this thing is coming from, okay? Now you might say it's wasted characters, it's wasted time, it's wasted programming, yeah. But look, if I'm halfway down the program, I know that this is coming from namespace standard because I've typed it in, all right? So we will be typing standard vector, right? We will be typing that. I'm not using namespace standard in this course. If you put using namespace standard in your assignment, especially in a header file, which you never do ever, ever, 
put using namespace standard in a header file, that's marks taken off. Okay, we're we're being this is a programming course, not a do whatever you want course. Excuse me. All right. So let's do something interesting now. We've got an integer. Uh, this is my int equals ten. Or let's do my age, right? My age, thirty-seven. Uh, int uh, added equals twenty, and then we can do something like this, where we say standard c out my age plus added, and then I can add this, and it should print out fifty-seven, right? So we can uh, we can print out uh, integers just by using standard c out, just like we would any other variable. Also in C++, uh, we have strings, okay? So standard string um, name equals Dave Churchill. Okay, down here, I can print out name. Okay, Dave Churchill, right? Um, there are lots of different functions you can do on name, which I won't be doing here. Uh, but for example, uh, if I want to say add strings together, then that's really easy in C++. I can say Dave plus this plus Churchill, right? And that will add those together. Oh, geez, did I forget to do that? Okay, so you can kind of do that if I go like, Standard string first equals Dave. You can add strings, but you can't add arbitrary characters together like that. Standard string last equals Churchill. I can say name equals first plus space plus last. There we go. Okay, so you can add strings and string literals together. What I mean by a string literal, if I actually type the thing in quotation marks, that is a string literal. If I have a standard string, that is a C++ string. Okie doke. Now, let me refer to my notes to see what I was going to do. All right, so that's like the basic printing of variables and stuff like that. Let's write a class now, okay? So, oh, actually, let's write a function. Um, so I'm going to write a function. Why does this look different? All right. That T looks a little strange to me. I don't know why. So we're going to have a function here. And this function is going to be get number. And this function is going to return 42. Right? Of course, because it's the, the key to the universe and everything. So get number. So what will this program return? Uh-oh, what have I done wrong here? Expected initializer before standard. Oh, I see. I forgot my opening curly brace. All right, I knew I wasn't that bad. Okay, so this will print out 42. So just like Java, just like JavaScript, just like Python, I can put function calls in here. Now, here is the difference, one of the main differences between C++ and Java. So I'm going to grab this function and I'm going to put it down here. Okay? The C++ compiler works from top to bottom. If I ever try and call a function that I haven't seen yet, it will be an error. Okay? Unlike Java, where you can define things after they're used, etc. Now, the only, the only exception to this is class functions, but we'll talk about that later. So if here, if my compiler is scanning from top to bottom and it finds line five where I call get number, it's gonna say, I don't know what get number is. You haven't told me what it is yet. Okay, so get number was not declared in this scope. And then it makes some stupid suggestion um, that is not at all what I wanted it to do. Okay, so when get number was above here, it worked because I had defined the function and then I was able to use it. But notice that it said function was not declared. So here's the rule. 
When you're compiling, there's a function declaration and a function definition. So if I declare a function, get number, this is a function declaration, okay? This means that I declare that this function exists. So somewhere there's a function called get number that takes no parameters as input and returns an integer. So based on that information, my compiler can now run and compile this program because it knows that a function called get number exists. Later on, when it goes to run the program, as long as that function has been linked in somewhere from some C++ file, then the program will run, okay? So let's run it now. There's no compilation error at all. But if down here, if I had say not written this, what would the error message be here? Aha, now I get a linker error, okay? So this is where you need to know why the difference between the compiler and the linker. So this is a function declaration, meaning that my, my code can compile. When my code goes to run, it will try and find the function get number. Sorry, when my code goes to be linked, it will try and find somewhere in all of the object files that are being linked, the function definition for get number. And the definition includes the actual workings of the code. So here, the linker is being run and it says, um, so if you see the message here, you see it says LD. LD is the linker program. And it says undefined reference to get number. So get number has been declared, but it can't link because it hasn't been defined. So the compiler needs declarations and the linker needs definitions. So if I go back and I remove this, okay, and now my definition is complete, then the linker says, oh, look, the function is there, I can now run. Okay, and the reason why this matters, we'll get into in a little bit. Okie doke. By the way, feel free to ask any sorts of questions that you have. We're gonna be, we're gonna be programming for a little while. And the good thing is I can make the lecture as long as I want and program for as long as I want. And I really like programming. So let's keep doing that for a bit. So now let's make a class. I'm gonna make my own class. I'm gonna call this class student. So I say class student, okay? Very important, a class definition ends with a semicolon. I've made that mistake about a thousand times. Now, inside a class, you know how in Java you have to say like public static void mains or private add something or public whatever before a function? In C++, you don't declare that on every function. You declare like groups of things. So in here, I can say private, and then anything after this will be a private thing. I can declare public and anything after that will be public. Okay, so for example, if I type public here, I like it to be like this. Then everything after the public is publicly usable by things outside the class. If you have not explicitly said anything, then it will be private, okay? So anything I put in here by default will be private. Now, some people enjoy putting the private keyword in there to be explicit. Some people like to put public things first. I have just gotten used to, um, and I find it nice to say, okay, I'm gonna put the private things first, and I'm gonna public things set, okay? So inside my student class, I want to store some private variables. So let's say uh, someone shout out a suggestion in the chat of what I should store inside a student class. What are some variables that I should have that are pertaining to a student? We'll do this live just to make sure it's not scripted. Okay. Name, student ID, credit loan, lots of stuff, okay? So I think pretty much every student has a name. So what we're going to do is we're going to include a standard string 
and this is going to be the name. In this course, I'm going to be using, I think it's, is it Hungarian or some sort of type of notation, where private member variables have the m underscore suffix in front of them, okay? And whenever you refer to this private member variable, it's going to have m underscore whatever. And we will be using camel case for our name. So this will be what it would look like if I had m first name, m last name, whatever, okay? So let's do that. Let's have a first name, let's have a standard string, m last name, okay? What are some other things that we had in there? So we had someone said a student ID. So let's have an integer, um, m uh, student ID. And we had a grade in there, okay? So let's take int m grade as well, okay? In C++, since C++11 and onward, uh, we can define default values for these things um, inside the code of the class here, okay? So for example, uh, if I want the default first name to be first, and I want the default last name to be last, and I want the default student ID to be zero, and I want the default grade to be zero, okay? So that's how I can do this. So now if I call the default constructor on student, it will have these values. So let's go ahead and write a constructor for a student then. So student, um, this is the, the, the syntax for the constructor, okay? So as input then, we want to pass in probably a first name, a last name, a student ID, and a grade, right? So let's do that. So standard string, uh, first standard string, last uh, int id int grade perfect fits on the line so we i am intentionally making some mistakes here if you see things that i can improve as i'm typing them please put them in the chat and we'll incorporate those back in so i can say m first name equals first m last name equals last uh, m student ID equals ID and M grade equals grade. Okay. Ah, perfect. All right. So we've got some C++ people in the house. So this is uh, a good example of what not to do. All right. So what we've done, and there's like, no, there's, a, there's no error here, right? It's just that there is a better way of doing this in C++. So what happens in C++ when you call the constructor is that the object first gets constructed with all of these default values. And then the code inside the constructor happens, okay? So if you think about that, what first happens is that we give first name the value of first, we initialize that string, we give last name the value of last, we initialize that string, we give student ID the value of zero, we give grade the value of zero, and then this line runs. Then we set first name equal into the input first, we set last name equal to input last, and so we've done twice the work that we have to. We've set up the default stuff, and then we've, we've overwritten it. So there's a way that you can um, get around that in C++ by something called an initializer list. So what this will do, um, and the syntax for that is this, and I like doing it this way. You can do it all on the one line if you want. Okay, so what this does, what this does is it allows you to set the values immediately as the student is being constructed without using the default values, okay? Now, there's an added benefit to this. So someone just said, uh, there's a small handful of situations where not using initializer lists can cause errors as well. That's true, and I'll show you one of those now. So, 
Let's say that we know for sure that a student's student ID will never change. Okay, actually, let me compile this first, make sure I haven't. Um... Okay, so I'm going to delete this. So let's just delete that line. So no comp compilation errors right now. Let's make a student. Okay, uh, student s, and then we'll pass in Dave Churchill. I'm so old that my student number is three, and my grade is 100, of course, right? Uh, now, let me just get something to like print, uh, print my name, okay? Standard string, uh, get name, and what we're gonna do here is something where I just return uh, m first name plus this plus m last name. All right. Now down here, I'm going to standard c out, and I'm going to print out student name s dot get name. And I'm going to be lazy and do the thing I told you not to do. All right, student name David Churchill. Right. So there you go. Uh, okay, so let's say that we know that our student ID is never going to change. Then what we can do is we can make a const. So const, const is an overloaded keyword in C++. It happens in a number of ways. But I can say that um, my student ID is never going to change. And so if, for example, like someone had said, I tried to give this a value down here, What would happen is it would run this line of code, but the compiler will say, hey, you have a const variable here. So you can't edit a const variable. So this is illegal, right? So assignment of read only member M student ID. So the only way that you can set const member variables in C++ via inputs is is via an initializer list. And that's because it sets it up right away without having to, to do that actual assignment, okay? So if you have const, if all these are const, then you need to do it in an initializer list, but not only that, initializer lists are also faster. Can anyone else tell me another bad practice that I'm doing here? Because there's a very bad practice that I'm doing. When doing initializer lists, what's the difference between using the curly brackets and round? Well, you can only use the round ones as far as, I'm, as, far as I can tell. Um, I don't think this is a thing that will work. Oh, it will, okay. Honestly, I don't know. I've never seen that, and that's the first time in many, many years that I've ever heard of someone using that. So that's a new one to me. Okay. Here's something in C++ that's very important, and I may have it on a slide and I may not, is that everything, everything in C++ is passed by value and not by reference, okay? So if I pass a string, if I have my declaration of this variable as just a string, then that is actually going to be passed by value. Same thing with the integers. Okay, so I'm gonna put these on different. So what I wanna do is I want to pass in a reference. Now, next lecture, I'm going to get into references and pointers. So don't worry about this too much. But here is what I actually want to do is pass in a reference to the, these things. And actually, I don't want those to be able to change. So I'm gonna pass in const references to those things. Now, we'll talk about this next class, but this is just a good practice, okay? All right. So this means I'm not copying the string whenever I do this. All right, so now we run this again, it all works. Okay, now let's say something we're going to be doing in this course a lot is using configuration files, all right? Okay, um, someone just asked, do we need a destructor? So let me actually, uh, I talk about this next class, but let me do something here. Standard uh, C out student constructor. Okay, so I'm gonna put the constructor here. 
There's also a destructor, which you declare like this. Standard cout student destructor. Okay, so this is important. The lifetime of objects in C++ is until the end of scope, okay? So this object here, this student, because it's allocated on the stack, and we're gonna talk about this next time. I'm sorry that I got out of order here, but for those who know C++, this isn't so bad. So here, we create this student object, S. This student object will be deleted once its current scope ends, which is down here. So when we create the object, we'll see student constructor happen. And when we delete the, well, when, this, when the student object goes out of scope, its destructor is called, and that gets called. So let's see what this prints out. So student constructor, Dave Churchill, nothing else gets printed, the block of code exits, and we have student destructor, okay? This is not a, a C++ course, but that is a, actually a very important concept. So thank you for bringing that up. Now, if we do not declare a destructor, then all of the classes that we have here as member variables, their destructors will be called, okay? So luckily, standard string, its destructor will be called and the string will be cleaned up. This will be called and it will be cleaned up. Int, well, int is a base type, so it cleans itself up. Int is a base type, it cleans itself up. So in cases where we don't have any pointers with heap allocated memory, we do not need to declare a destructor. We will understand what the hell that means at the end of next class, okay? So, but thank you for the question. So if there's nothing crazy going on, we don't need to declare a destructor because the default destructor will call the destructors of all the things in, in the class. All right, so now what we're gonna do, we're gonna make sure that still runs. Um, let's delete this as well. I don't want to print that anymore. So now let's look at vector. Okay. So standard vector. Now vector uses generics just like Java. Okay. It's generics are done through things called templates, which we'll look at later. But let's say we want to have a vector of students and I'll call this, uh, my class. Okay. Oh no, not class. <laughs> call it course. Can't call it class because class is a reserved keyword. So down here, what I can do is let's create two students. Um, let's call David Churchill and David Churchillio and a new student ID and a new grade of a thousand because I'm just that much better. So this is S1, this is S2. Now I can say course dot push back. So push back, vectors act as stacks when you're adding or removing things. So I'm gonna push back S1 and course.pushback S2. And now I wanna do something where I iterate through the vector and print all of the students in the course, okay? So let's do that. Well, there's a bunch of different ways that I can iterate through STL containers. The first one, and the one you're probably very used to, um, is just with a for loop, right? So I can say for, um, int i equals zero, i is less than course dot size, okay? Because it's a vector, it has a size, i plus plus. Now, the student will be course i. So I can say, all right, let's print out the names of the students in the course. So standard c out um, student, and then I can print out uh, the name, the number of the student, so I'm going to say i plus 1, because I'm starting from 0. So I want to say student 1, student 2, student 3. Then I'm going to print out a uh, colon, and then course i dot get name. And then we'll print out a new line character. And that goes across, but whatever. So let's see if this compiles. Oh, look at this. Did you forget vector? I did. So I wanted to use a vector, but I did not include vector. So up here, I have to include vector. All right, now this worked. You can see here that it printed out student one and it printed out student two, but it gave me this error. 
And this error is warning me that I'm comparing a signed integer and an unsigned integer, okay? So signed integers have either a negative or a positive, which are defined in the integer itself. Unsigned integers are always positive, okay? Technically, the class is over, but I'm going to go on for a little while because I want to create this as a reference for you guys um, going forward. So I'm going to go on maybe for up to another half an hour, okay? But I want you guys to have this for people who are newer at C++. So in order to fix this, this is because course.size returns an unsigned integer. But I'm using a signed integer as the comparison. So here I could type unsigned, okay? or unsigned int, and then compile it, and I would no longer get that warning message. But um, preferably, there's a built-in type in C++ called a size t. And this is an unsigned integer, which will always be the same size of at least your pointers in memory, OK? So I prefer to use size t when I'm iterating through things. So size t i equals zero, it's just a size type i equals course dot si or less than course dot size i plus plus. So that's how I iterate through the courses. Now, another way that we can iterate through courses is with the actual iterator. Okay, so let me show you this. Um, actually, you know what? We're not going to be doing that this course. So let's not worry about that right now. Um, we are going to be using a range-based for loop. So just like other programming languages, which are a little bit simpler than C++, we can do simple range-based for loops as well. So I can say for student s in course. Now, I no longer have access to this i, right? So if I want to say student one, student two, I would have to keep a separate counter. So I'm not gonna do that right now. So what I'm going to do is now I've got s, and I'm going to say s.getName. So that works. I can print out the student, right? And I can iterate through the vector just by doing this. But very, very importantly, um, this also is copying values, OK? So here. I would want to have this be a reference. So I'm referring to the student in the course. It's, all, it's like, a, we'll talk about this later. But this is, this is much better because we're no longer copying those things. Now, I actually don't need to declare the type of thing in the container because C++11 and forward have the auto keyword. And the auto keyword is awesome. So, the compiler says, oh, look, this person is trying to iterate through the things in the course variable. The course variable is a vector of students. So of course they mean student, right? So I can say for auto s in course, and that will work as well. So that's how easy it is to, to get through a course, OK? The last thing I'll do is let's say, for example, um, I want to uh, I want to have these students be defined inside a text file, right? So something we're going to be doing a lot in this course is actually having things be defined in text files, like the size of the player, the number of levels, the level itself. So let's open another tab here in VI, and we're going to create some students. So I'm going to have Dave Churchill. Uh, so somebody come up with some fake student information in the chat that I can put into this, okay? So I need a first name, a last name, an ID, and a grade. So my ID is 3, and my grade is 100. I'll, I'll put in, now don't use your own, I don't want like your full whatever, just make up some like Superman or, or whatever. Oh, come on, someone's gonna do something. John Doe, okay, there we go. John Doe 569, very clever. Uh, David Churchid for 10,000. All right. Um, Bob Robert 9324545. And let's get uh, 
Let's get a Michael Jackson in there. All right, we've got one student who may or may not be alive. Oh, and we've got a Timo John 2910. All right, so here's our thing. Uh, we're going to save this as students.text. Okay, so we've got student.text. Um, now, so I go back to my program.c, and now what I'm going to do is let's all this stuff, right? One of, one of the big takeaways of this course that I want you to really take home is that wherever we are doing logic, like video game physics or like other uh, video game systems, we want the storage of data. That's true. Uh, well, A, don't assume their gender, but also let's get a female name in here. Um, Davida Trichila, and their student number is 100, and they have a grade of, of, uh, of 420. All right. There we go. I just put names that people suggested. So what I want to do is create our own data management wherever possible. Okay? So what we're going to do is instead of having manually having a vector of students, and we'll call that a course, let's create a class, a class course, right? Okay. Now, inside this class, we are going to have a vector of students, and that's going to be called students. Okay. Now, let's have the course constructor, and we actually don't have anything we really need to do in the constructor of this course, so I'm just gonna leave that on a single line like so. Or maybe I'll just put it like this, right, to make it all in style. Yes, you can have a struct if you want to, but this course will have some logic, and one of the logic parts of this course is we want to be able to load student data from a file, okay? So that's where I'm going with this. So, let's have a function where uh, this is a void function, it's not going to return anything, and this is add student. So that student, um, let's say uh, we're going to take in uh, a student object, right? Why not? Why not just take in a student object um, called student? And what is this going to do? Well, we've got our students vector, and all we're going to do is add this student to the end of the vector, right? Okay, so now down here, um, oh, one thing we might also want to do is get the students from the course, right? So if I just, if I write a function, vector student, get students, and down here, I return m students. Someone tell me why that is not what I want to do. Even though it will work, why don't I want to do this? Can anyone tell me that in the chat? I'll give you like 20, 30 seconds. There you go. So someone said copy, question mark. Yes, because what's happening here is this return type is a vector of students. So unlike in Java, okay, where objects are stored by technically copy of a reference, okay, by the pointer if you want to, this is not how you, you this is how you would write it in Java and it would, it would be fine. So what we want to do is return a reference to that student vector. Okay, so we're not actually copying the entire student vector back to the code we are referring to. Now, here's something that someone else said. It allows someone else outside the class to modify the vector. Oh, by the way, I have all notifications and stuff are turned off for classes. Um, it allows someone else to outside the class to modify the vector. Now, if I leave it like this, yes, it does, but Here's where I'm going to be returning a const vector reference. 
So what this does is it says return a reference to the internal students vector, but make sure it's const so that no one calling this function can actually modify the students, all right? Not only that, but there's another const that we can talk about that goes on the outside of a member variable at the end. And here, um, in this way, uh, I, th what this says, this const at the end says, this function will never modify this object, okay? And that's important. We will get into references and pointers and const correctness in the next lecture. That's not the point of this lecture, but I just wanted to use it in this lecture. So I apologize. I'm, I'm using something in order to get something done, and later I'll explain it a little bit further. Okay, so now let's go down where we had this, right? So I can do the following. I can say course, um, course, and then course, dot add student s1 course dot add student s2 all right now here i had to say for every student in course dot get students and this should work uh oh expected initializer before student i have left something out oh this was not a semicolon why didn't you guys tell me M student was not declared in this scope, which means that I made a typo. Okay, something I forgot. Since student up here is const, then this needs to be const. We'll talk about const correctness later. All right, so this works. Now, something else that I can do here to save code is that I do not need to define students on their own line. I can actually pass in students like this. Student, Dave, Churchill, three, 100, okay? And this will work just as well. Oh geez, what's wrong here? Okay. I'm going to be adding a const student reference. All right, perfect. The const correctness is important. We'll get into that later in the course. But this works as well. Now, the whole point of this, so far we haven't really saved anything, right? So let's delete all of this. And now we're going to add the students from this file that we just created. OK. So let's create a function, void add from file. Now we're going to pass in a const string reference file name. So finally, let's show you really, really simple file handling in C++. Okay? We won't go into all the details of file IO and streams, but what we do need is include fstream. Okay? This is the file stream library. So we want an input file stream. So what is that? It's a standard input f stream, input file stream. I call that f in for file in, and the constructor of that takes a file name, and that's it. Okay. Now, what happens if we have, say, a variable like a standard string, first name, last name? If we want to read in from our file stream, it's very, very easy. That pipe operator, we can use it in the op opposite direction. So there's a bunch of stuff in this file stream, and I want to start putting it into variables. This is actually where C++ is way faster than Java, okay? So I can literally just say, f in, go right into first. So what that will do, is it will look at the file and the first token separated by white space in the file will be put into the first variable, okay? And then I can say f in last, okay? So see how we have first name, last name, but next I have uh, a three, I, so I have a, an ID and I have a, a grade. So I need to set up temporary variables for those too. 
So I can say ID, great. Now I can say fn ID, fn great. Now what this will do is it will take the very first thing, it will take Dave, put it in first, it will take Churchill, put it in last, it will take three, put it in ID, and it will take 100 and put it in grade. All right, so let's just try that. Um, standard C out first. Oh, now actually I don't wanna print that out because I wanna show you how to do this in a loop, right? Now, here's the issue. If I call that and if this, if the first thing in the file is a string, and I try and put it into an integer, it will crash, okay? So there's all sorts of error handling stuff we could do here, but I'm not getting into that. Um, I just want this to work and we know the format of the thing. Not only that, but I want this to happen for each line of the file. I wanna keep reading in and reading in and reading in and reading in. So what happens here, if I go back, if I do this again and say F in first, that will work because the, the piping operator will skip spaces and new lines. So the next token in this file is actually John. So I don't even need to go line by line. I can just go token by token, okay? So let's show you the loop that you can use to do that in C++. So we're gonna use a while loop and we're gonna ask the file input stream, I want this to happen while there are still things in the file, okay? So the way you do that is fin.good. Okay, now I'm gonna take these things and paste them in here. So one of the really cool things is that there's actually a shortcut to this. There's even a shorter shortcut. When you say fin first, that operator, actually returns a reference back to the fin object. So I don't even need a second line here. I can say, give me first, give me last, give me ID, give me grade, and it will just do that. So I've already read in all those things with just that single line of code, okay? So how do I construct a student out of that? Well, I already have code for that. So what I wanna do, is I'll say, let's put it right into the students array. So I have my students array. I wanna push back a new student with first, last, ID, and grade. Look at that. Do that in two lines of code in Java, right? That is like one of the cases where C++ is really, really good. That's true, why not that? Um, so Strager just said, why not use the add student? Well, I was going to get to that, but uh, you know, how we can use the functions that we already have, but rather than manually adding it, let's call our functions add student. All right, so now I'll compile this. I'll see what happens. And Strager hasn't pointed out, so for, for those of you who don't know in the chat, Strager, you should go follow his channel as well. He, um, his entire channel is just sitting there listening, listening to people's uh, C++ and JavaScript problems and helping them. So if you're in either of my courses, you might want to subscribe to his channel, but don't do their assignments for them. So here I have taken in, I've opened up the file stream. I've created some temporary variables that I need to read values into. I've said, while there's still stuff in the file, grab these four items and then add a student. And then what will happen is um, you'll go to the next character or the next um, token when you read first again, and that'll just work, okay? So this all compiled, fine. So what we'll do now is down here, we'll say course dot add from file, and then we'll say students dot text. And then why don't we make a print function? So void print. And inside print, we'll say for auto student in and students. 
standard C out, or I'll just call this S. Now, can I get the name? I want to get the grade. I'll say int grade const return m grade int id const return m id. Okay, so now I can get all the things. Alrighty. So we're going to print out s dot get name and a space and then s dot id and then a space and then s dot grade and then a new line. All right, so now all I have to do is say course dot print, right? MID was not declared because it is capitalized. Apologies. Where is that? Oh, it's M student ID. All right, perfect. So who can tell me what is incorrect about this output? A lot of it is correct. Some of it is not correct. Well, I won't sit here forever, but the last line, yeah. So uh, Nico said the last time, yeah, I can't have a possible grade of 100. The last line has been repeated, okay? And the reason for this is very technical. And it's the fact that our f in piping operator left the end of file character at the end. Okay? So we need to catch that. There's two ways that we can do this. What, what you can do is the following. After you read this stuff in, you can say if f in dot eof break okay so you have to check for eof and then that'll work and it won't duplicate all right but also you can check you can do it this way you can read into the first variable the next token and then the return of that will be false if it read in EOF, okay? So this is the preferred way if you know that your input is formatted correct, all right? So this works. So while, try to get the first name. If there's a valid first name, then we read the last name, the ID, and the grade. If the first name we tried to read in was the end of the file, this will return false and we won't enter the for loop, okay? So, this has been uh, the live coding session. I want to go back and just cover the rest of this lecture um, really, really briefly, because we're going to need this going forward. All right. So let's get back to we were. Where were we? I think I was here. OK. So here's how we compile. All right. Now, if you want to see the results of pre-processing, you can do that with the dash E flag. We won't be doing that in this course. This is just kind of trivia. If you want to compile things to an object file, you can use the dash C flag. That will produce an object file, which you can later, um, you can later iterate over. Oh, thank you for telling me. Yes, I do have slides up. Um, PowerPoint, there we go. Uh, if you're compiling uh, with a dash C flag, that will create an object file, which you then can link later. Um, and then later, you can take all of your object files and you can link them to a single executable, all right? And like I said, I know that this lecture is going late, but for those of you who are still a bit new with C++, I don't want to rush through this, right? So you can, you can take off if you want to, or you can stay and you can watch. Um, so if you have multiple files, which we will, you can have a 
single command if you want that will compile everything, okay? You can say G++ and you can say stir.cpp, which says compile all of my C++ files. Um, it will not generate the intermediate uh, object files and it recompiles every C++ file each time. So linking is much, much faster than running. So ideally, if we have a large project, what you will do is you would only want to recompile the C++ files um, to .o files if uh, the CPP file has changed. So that can be done with a make file. It's automatically done by Visual Studio, but this is sort of a, like a, a lower level thing in C++ that we're not super concerned with in this course, because even if we just use that one command to compile everything, it will take like two seconds. So we're not gonna go into that right now. I will talk about the preprocessor though. So the preprocessor runs all the specific preprocessor directives. Some of those possible directives are including a library. So that will include a library that lives somewhere in your system. You can include a specific file on your system, and I'll get into that a little bit more in the next class. You can use defines. So these are macros where you can literally find and replace text. They are very dangerous, and we want to use them as, as, as very sparingly as possible. So in C and in C++, you can literally say define one as zero. So wherever you type a one, it will replace it with a zero. So it's very, very uh, bad to do that sort of thing in practice. But it is useful in some cases. Um, so include x with the brackets, um, just inserts file x into there. Um, so include myobject.h. The preprocessor literally takes the myobject.h file and just pastes it wherever that include file, the, the include command was. So if you have include myclass.h and you run it through the preprocessor and you view the preprocessor output, the entirety of myobject.h will actually be there pasted into it. So this is the entire um, compilation process. Again, I won't go over all the steps again. So why do we want to separate C++ files and H files? Okay, so the C++ class code is, is, is often separated into H files, those are header files, and CPP files or implementation files or definition files. Again, I showed this before, but a declaration essentially says that a function exists and this is how you use the function. So for example, int sum, it says it's going to return an int. The function is called sum. It's going to take in two integer arguments, x and y. And that's it. It doesn't give any definition. That's a declaration. Um, in a definition, uh, you have the actual code that carries out the function. Okay. Um, I see, yeah, Strager is giving me some hints here, but I'm not going to be able to follow those along with the slides. Um, so definition, here we actually have the code. So here is the whole thing. So we would have in brackets return x plus y, right? So the, the declaration just says what the function does and it ends with a semicolon. The definition gives the actual code itself. So in header files, typically, the header files will contain the class or function declarations, okay? Declarations include the function name, return type, arguments, etc. They are required by C++ to see all the declarations of the classes, functions, variables before use. They serve several useful purposes beyond just the required declarations. Okay, so I did this example already, but I'll go over it again real quick. If I have a function, let's say it's my function, and I want to use my class and I want to instantiate my class like I, like I did with a student, and then do something with it. If I define, or sorry, if I, if, yeah, if I define my my class below where I've called it, the my function won't be able to see it. So I can't define it after I've called it, okay? Sorry, I can't declare it after I've called it. But I can define it before I've called it, right? So for example, 
If I put all the declarations for my class above my function in that file, then this will work. But what I should do, and the preferred way of doing this, is I will write all of the declarations for my class in a header file, and then just say include my class.h. And the include statement will literally take the contents of my class.h and paste it right there. Okay? So it's as if I had typed it there, but it's safely, neatly in its own file. Okay. So some of the, better, the, the benefits of header files, in my opinion, um, one benefit is that they allow you to see the class functionality at a glance without being overloaded with the implementation details. So for example, one of the things we're gonna make in this course is a vector class. It's gonna be a vec2, it's gonna hold an x and a y. And you can see here with the header file, you can see all the declarations. So you can see all the types of operators on one screen that the vector class will implement. But you don't get bogged down with all the details, right? So it's separating the design of the class from the implementation of the class. And anytime you can separate the design and the implementation, it reduces cognitive load and it helps you with programming. So another benefit is that headers very seldom change, leading to less frequent compiling. Okay, so headers change far less frequently than um, implementation files. Some of the drawbacks of header files is that, well, there's more files in your code base. That always sucks. You're going to have more tabbing back between header files and CPP files. That's a little bit annoying. Um, in C++, this is something that we won't run into in this course because I've designed it out of the course, but you may have cyclic dependencies. So for example, if you have class A, which depends on class B, and class B, which depends on class A, that's a cyclic dependency, so they depend on each other. In Java, those are automatically resolved for you. But in C, oh sorry, in C++, they are not automatically resolved for you. And so that's something that's a little bit annoying. So again, um, what happens is we have our source code files, we have header files, sometimes they're HPP if we're working with templates, we'll talk about that later. They get compiled into object files, um, one object file per CPP file typically, they all get linked together into a program. Um, I'm not gonna go over all the primitive types because they're very similar to Java, same thing with arithmetic operators with the, um, with the caveat that now we have bitwise operators, which I'm not gonna go into in this lecture. I'll talk about bitwise operators in another lecture. Um, and the rest of this uh, I've already gone over. Functions, classes, class constructor, um, initializer lists, destructor, STL containers, um, some sample syntax. I've already gone over this in the live coding, but I wanted this to be in the PDF file for you as well. Okay, so we can add things to a set. We have maps, um, etc. Okay, so that is the lecture that I have for you today. Let's see, where will I go now? I will go, I'll go to the iPad screen. So I know that was a bit long. I just wanted to make sure that I got all of the content in um, for today that I wanted to get in. And Feel free to watch back that lecture and you can watch back the live coding if you want. Um, thanks to Strager who showed up with a couple of uh, helpful hints. And uh, I, I highly recommend you go follow his channel as well and check him out. He usually operates a bit later at night for all of us computer science night owls. Um, does some really good uh, C++ and JavaScript help there. Thanks for tuning in and uh, I'll see you on Thursday where we start to talk about pointers and stack and heap memory and, and that's where C++ starts to get really interesting and really beneficial. All right, see you later.